This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Yes, there is a chill in the air, but it is warm and toasty here in the studio. Thanks so much for tuning in to another edition of The Farm Monitor. I am Ray D'Alessio. As you can see, no Kenny this week. Nonetheless, everything else stays the same. Coming up, moving forward financially after Hurricane Michael, The Monitor talks to a local economist who has some helpful tips to make the recovery process a little easier. Also on the program, John Holcomb travels to North Georgia and highlights a farm described as a place for healing and hope. Plus, it's a sport that combines the skill of an equestrian with the precision and accuracy of an archer, an ancient pastime now gaining in popularity. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. We are now a few weeks removed from Hurricane Michael, which left a path of destruction in its wake throughout South Georgia. Damon Jones tells you how that will affect the commodity markets and what farmers should prioritize while rebuilding. This is some of the aftermath left by Hurricane Michael as crops, trees, and buildings were blown over by more than 100 mile an hour wind. One of the crops most affected was cotton as this year's bumper yield was wiped away in a matter of hours. And the timing of the storm couldn't have been any worse. We had a hurricane last year, which hurt some people. And this year, the cotton crop was looking really good. People thought they were gonna get that money back. So I get on solid financial ground, and then just as they were starting to harvest the cotton, you know, Hurricane Michael came in and took a lot of it away. People went from 1,300 pound an acre cotton to nothing left worth sending the picker through the field. One of the worst parts of this is that's at the end of the season. So you spent all the money growing it. It's the absolute worst time to have a hurricane. But despite the nearly $600 million of estimated damage to this crop, the impact on the world market probably won't be that noticed. Cotton, I think what we lost, even though it was a huge amount for Georgia, wasn't that huge an amount in terms of world cotton supply. So I don't think we'll see a big bump up in cotton prices or, or anything else. The same, however, cannot be said for pecans. With Georgia being the largest producer in the nation, the lack of production caused by the storm here in the state should keep prices strong despite the trade tariffs with China. This take, uh, took a lot of supply out of the equation, should help firm up those pecan prices. So at least if you have nuts left, you should get a good price for them. If I had pecans left, I would be trying to get them to market early if I could. I don't know that holding on is gonna make things better, but certainly it's a year where if you weren't damaged by the hurricanes, you wanna do a really good job of harvesting because every one of those nuts is gonna be worth more than usual. That's not the only nut market that could be affected. Even though the peanut crop around the state wasn't severely damaged, the structures that housed the crop were. We lost very few peanuts in the storm, but we suffered damage to every peanut buying point in southwest Georgia. If we don't find a way to buy the peanuts and store the peanuts, because the storage facilities were damaged too, we could lose enough peanuts to affect the price of, of peanuts and peanut butter. As for the next step farmers affected by the storm should take, it's important to stay up to date with upcoming disaster relief payouts and avoid taking on debt as much as possible. If we don't know something in December, it's going to be too late that we can't get disaster relief six months from now because everybody's got to pay those loans. They got to get new loans if they're going to stay in business and we need to know what our financial situation is. So I think the thing is try and get that information as soon as you can and figure out a way so that you can go forward without having a debt load that's just completely unbearable. You know, adjust to that new reality and move forward. So everybody I've talked to, they're moving forward. They're fixing the damage, they're getting ready to go on, and they're all busy trying to figure out a way to stay in business and keep growing crops in Georgia. Reporting from Athens, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. And once again, we want to remind you that if you would like to help those in Georgia affected by Hurricane Michael, Georgia Farm Bureau is accepting donations to aid in the relief efforts. You can find more information on how to donate by visiting gfb.ag slash storm relief. In the meantime, here in the U.S., horses are mostly used for pleasure. 
But what's nice about them is that they are very versatile animals. In addition to recreational riding, they're widely used for various forms of therapy. John Holcomb visited one therapeutic ranch in northwest Georgia. Here at this ranch in northwest Georgia, wonderful work is being done. Work that aligns with research that suggests riding horses can help those with disabilities both in the body and brain due to the releasing of endorphins. I recently paid a visit to the ranch to talk about their programs. By using certain circular patterns and uh, serpentine patterns, you can stimulate those neurotransmitters. And then hopefully at the conclusion of the lesson or toward the end, we can help the individual work on what they need to work on, whether it's learning to talk or whether it's something academically or social interactions or even just learning sequencing in life. The therapy sessions they do can also help those with physical disabilities as well. We have a, lot, a whole different approach we take as far as strengthening their core. Hopefully some uh, individuals afflicted with um, cerebral palsy, we can get better use of their arms and legs, their limbs. And, and overall, we have had actually had people walk who were barely not walking, and we've had people sit up, uh, particularly younger children who never could before. I got the chance to speak to one of the parents and ask her about her son, William, who has one of the rarest disabilities on the planet and the effect the therapy has had on him. He just turned 13 years old, and he, um, a couple years ago, was diagnosed with CDK13, and it's a very, very rare syndrome. Um, right now we know of less than 50 cases worldwide, and um, they're the majority of the children or the people so far that we have been connected with that do have it are overseas, mostly in uh, Eastern Europe, and um, but there are probably about, we're probably getting close to 20 cases in the United States. She started bringing William last year and wasn't sure how it would go. But as it turns out, he absolutely loves it. I wasn't sure whether or not he would enjoy doing this because he, um, he's allergic to animals, strangely enough, and he is scared off by a kitten. Animals scare him. But with Sarah, he's not scared at all. He hugs on her, he plays with her, he loves her, and he just immediately made a connection with her and took her right off. I mean, it was just like he'd been doing it all of his life. In just one year, they can already see positive results in William. We did it year-round last year and for 30 minutes at a time, and it went so well that now we are increasing it up to an hour for him to be able to spend an hour. Um, it calms him down. It just sort of centers him. It relaxes him. Um, he deals with anxiety issues and um, so it helped greatly with that also. Reporting in Tunnel Hill for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Thank you, John. Up next, once a basic survival skill, horse archery is now a worldwide sport and growing in popularity here in the U.S., including Georgia. My family's been farming for several generations. My great-grandmother actually is who started the peaches, but um, we didn't actually get into the market until 66. My granddad started it. Um, it used to just be a, um, just a peach trailer full of peach boxes. He'd just pull up, up under the, uh, one of the pecan trees out there in the orchard and sell them right there on the side of 49. You know, open a new location like this, this is so unlike our other market. You know, other one's an open air, you know, country style market, um, and this is an enclosed, you know, it's just it's just a lot different. Columbus is a really rich market, and we've already we had a pretty good customer base here already that would actually travel to Montezuma. So it was really it was a no-brainer to come here. I mean, it really was. It was just um, we've been trying to get here for a few years, and finally, you know, we got the opportunity on this place, and uh, it just seemed like the right time. Um, well, we're gonna have you know fresh peaches, tomatoes. Uh, we've got fresh shelled peas. We've got squash, zucchini, eggplant, bell peppers, an assortment of hot peppers. Well, it's just fresher here. I mean, the stuff you see in grocery stores, I mean, it's, if that's your only option, that's, that's fine. But, you know, that stuff was picked green and it was treated so that it would ripen slower or maybe not, you know. It just, it's, it, it was picked green so there's not as much flavor. The stuff we have in here, the tomatoes are vine ripened. We pick them ripe. You know, um, it's just the peaches, they're not hydrocooled. It's just straight off the tree, straight in the truck, straight here. We don't have to seek it out 
you know, go around the state to different markets and stuff and try to find what we need. We've already, we've just, we've got it. You know, it's right there on the farm. And uh, as long as it's in season, we're gonna have it, you know. If we can keep it local, you know, between our farm and then local businesses here, that's really what we want. Throughout time, horses and archery have gone hand in hand. In fact, early Native Americans used it for hunting and of course, during times of war. Nowadays, it's more of an art form and a skill set seen at competitions worldwide, including one right here in Georgia, set to take place the weekend of November 17th and 18th. Recently, I spent the day at Falconwood Farms in Covington, Georgia, where riders were sharpening their skills and loading up their arrows. It's really big over in Asia and Europe. Um, you know, it started in the, the steppe region. Um, like you said, most of it's uh, history based on warfare, uh, hunting and gathering. Uh, as far as here in the States, you know, our Native Americans used to hunt mostly the Plains Indians. Um, so it is a big part of our history here. And now it's, it's becoming more and more popular as a sport. The horse is moving right at about 11 feet per second. So when you shoot, you gotta shoot and follow through and drift your arrow into the target. Uh, you gotta account for distance, you gotta account for the speed of the arrow, uh, speed of the horse, uh, how far the distance you're from the arrow, I mean from the target. So that's, that's, that's a lot, so it's a lot of science that goes in. The first time that I did it, I like so much adrenaline. I was really excited and just <laughs> so happy. And it's just, I don't really know how to explain it. You're riding your horse. You're not able to necessarily pay attention to the horse as much because you're like focusing on shooting the target and everything. So you have to have that bond and that connection with, between you and your horse. I got involved with horse archery. Uh, my husband was actually interested in, in the cowboy mounted shooting and wanted me to do it. And I was like, no, I'm not really a gun person. I'm like, these girls are ex-barrel racers. And it, it just looks so difficult to you. And then um, I had found a clinic out right, in West go. Georgia on horseback archery. And I thought, it was a, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was like one of those spam ads on Facebook. <laughs> I really did. And I called and, and she goes, no, this is for real. Come on out, try it and I loaded my horse up, drove two and a half hours out, spent a day out there and had a ball. The, the first time I ever shot a bow and arrow was off of my horse. It is a martial arts, but the accuracy, uh, again, controlling your horse, dropping the reins, being able to shift the horse with your body weight, uh, giving the horses like certain cues, but you have to trust that horse. At the same time, you know, I like it because of the focus that you have to have to put into shooting arrow and like meditation, your breathing technique to release, uh, pushing arm forward. There's so many things that go in that plays a part in martial art. And I like the horses because like, you can tell a kid or an adult about respect, but you know, they really don't understand it. But when you give them a horse, you either respect that horse, and that horse respect you, or somebody get hurt. How far do you want to take this? Like I said, you're 13. You got the world in front of you. How far do you want to take this? Um, I want to make it. I want to pretty much try to do it throughout my life until I can't anymore. And um, I want to make it to Korea to the championships. Um, I'm not quite there yet, but I've been working hard and trying to get better and everything. I think the youth is, is where it's at with anything. So we try to encourage a lot of the novices and the youth. We really try to cater to them while still making you know, the competition and practices challenging for the more advanced archers. Pretty neat stuff. And again, you can see some of the world's best horse archers right here in Georgia. And best of all, it is free. November 17th and 18th, Falconwood Farms in Covington, Georgia. For more information about the tournament, log on to www.gahorsearchers.com. 
And while you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. In the meantime, the 2018 National FFA Convention has come and gone, but for members here in Georgia, it is one they will never forget. Kenny Bergamy has the recap. For starters, on Wednesday of the convention, it was the Blakely County FFA chapter winning a national title for ag mechanics and technology systems. The team, comprised of Jacob Smith, Seth Dubois, Louis Lumley, and Tucker Felkins, along with sponsor Dr. Walt Parks. Speaking of victories, how about this performance at the annual talent show by Emma Long of Pickens County? Just a small town girl living in a lonely world Took the midnight train going anywhere Long's version of the Journey Classic, a Showstopper, earning her top honors in the competition. Unfortunately, Indianapolis was the end of the road for Georgia native Ian Bennett, his one-year tenure as the Southern Regional National Vice President coming to a close, but not before telling his fellow members that he saw and learned a lot about the world and met a lot of good people. But without a doubt, arguably the biggest highlight of the week, President Donald Trump. His appearance marking the first time in 27 years that a sitting U.S. president spoke at the National FFA Convention. You are the ones shaping our industry. You are the ones who will shape our destiny. You are the ones writing our history. And you are the future farmers of America. You're the ones who will help truly, you've heard my expression, make America great again. You will make America great again. When we come back, restoring the grounds at historic Fort Campbell. Charles Denny with a special look at where families go for counseling if they lose a loved one in the line of duty. Thousands of service members leave the armed forces each year, and many of them are seeking new career opportunities. The United States Department of Agriculture is stepping up to help. Farming and agriculture is a lifestyle, just like military is a lifestyle. There are multiple programs that assist beginning farmers and ranchers not only getting started, but to grow and thrive, manage the risk, and help build critical stewardship of their resources. There's both a huge need and a huge opportunity for the next generation of farmers and ranchers to come and be a part of growing the future. Veterans in particular have the skill set and work ethic that is directly at the heart of what it takes to make a good farmer or rancher. Farmers like Navy veteran Lenny Miles Jr. carry the responsibility for growing food, which he does on his family farm with his father and grandfather. If you're interested in owning or operating a farm, Lenny has this to say. It's endless possibilities of where you could go as a career in agriculture or farming and you just feel responsible to present good product for consumers and compelled to take care of the land. Farmers and ranchers understand that the land is a resource to be protected and enhanced. Lenny uses farm loans from USDA's Farm Service Agency and participates in the Conservation Reserve Program and the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program to improve wildlife habitat and erosion control. So with the CRP and CREP programs, we take traditionally unproductive land out of farming production and put into conservation. It's important to be a good steward of land and be a responsible farmer. But Lenny isn't alone. Other farmers have taken up the reins as farmers. They come from occupations you wouldn't necessarily expect. Tom and Anita Roberson both served in the Army a combined 34 years in the medical field. Tom worked in private practice for several years before leaving the medical field for a new kind of field. As beginning farmers, the couple then worked on their passion in farming, and not too long after, they were operating their own farm. If you want to get into farming, the only excuse that you have is yourself, because the resources are there. The government, USDA, has plenty of resources. Those resources help farmers with getting started and operating the day-to-day. -day. But Anita stresses, you have to be ready before you start. 
The first thing you want to do is have a business plan. You have to have a starting point and know what you want to shoot for. Farmers and ranchers are part of the small business fabric of America. The USDA has teamed up with SCORE, a nonprofit resource partner of the Small Business Administration, to connect farmers, ranchers, and other small business owners with free business mentors. The Small Farm Outreach Program, they have a wonderful beginning farmer and rancher program. Well, they'll take you through all the steps. Those mentors can help you with your business plan and establish good foundations for your business. There's a place for you in agriculture, and USDA is here to be your partner in this exciting new adventure. Some have already answered the call. Come talk to us today. Finally this week, when a military family loses a loved one in the line of duty, many people in the civilian world want to step up and help. As we celebrate Veterans Day this month, Charles Denny brings us the story of how Master Gardeners at Fort Campbell, Kentucky are doing a project to aid our service families while at the same time providing beautiful gifts of time. Serene, gorgeous landscaping, an artistic gardener's touch that offers respect and sympathy. Clarksville Master Gardeners, like Kim Weed, spent nearly 300 volunteer hours here at Fort Campbell working the grounds at this historic home. For the soldiers and families at the military base, it's known as the SOS House, Survivor Outreach Services. It's where people come for counseling or just time to grieve or reflect after a loved one is lost in the line of duty. It was a part of making it a place that when they got out of their cars as they're walking up to the Survivor Outreach Services that they felt the care that goes on inside the house reflected on the outside. This project was made possible by community donations. A master gardening intern drew up a design plan and then more than 1,400 plants were installed here the past few months. Uh, we wanted a diverse variety of plants. With any landscape, you don't want to just stick to one thing. Carla Keene with Tennessee State University Cooperative Extension led this effort. The Master Gardener program is coordinated by University of Tennessee and TSU Extension with 2,500 volunteers statewide. The yard at the SOS house now includes Japanese maples, autumn ferns, hostas, and many other plants, a complete renovation of the grounds. Now the volunteers work to maintain the landscape. It takes about three hours to water all these plants. Wow. And since they did, most of the plants went into the ground um, late May, first part of June, mm -hmm. which, you know, at that time of the year, the weather gets kind of iffy. And so, um, but we had the people out here watering and caring for the plant. One of those people is Master Gardener Luis Almeida, retired from the military, and now his wife is stationed at Fort Campbell. Luis wanted to give back to other service families. I hope when families come here, they get a sense of tranquility and uh, comfort. Uh, a lot of people come and they leave rocks, you know, with family members' names throughout the garden, and it's, uh, it's, it be helpful for them to see a garden that's well maintained when they're leaving. Landscaping is no substitute for a lost life, but this is caring grown from the ground up. Red, white, blue, and green. Plants and patriotism. For families of the fallen, it's our way of saying we are with you. This is Charles Denny reporting. Great stuff, Charles, and to all of our military members, active or retired, we thank you for your service. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Fire Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure to check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Fire Monitor. <laughs>